Hello, everybody. We're just going to wait for the room to fill up before we get started. Thank you for coming. Give it one more minute. We can get started now. Um, welcome to tonight's book launch of the Proceedings of the Sixth International Conference Beyond Camps and Forced Labor. My name is Christine Schmidt, and I'm the Deputy Director and Head of Research at the Wiener Holocaust Library. On behalf of my co-editors, Suzanne Bargett and Dan Stone, I'm delighted to welcome you to this event. The library is proud to be among the co-organizers of the Beyond Camps and Forced Labor Conference, along with my colleagues from the University of Wolverhampton, Imperial War Museums, Royal Holloway University of London, the Pears Institute for the Study of Antisemitism, and Birkbeck University of London. Although it's unfortunate that we are not all just recovering from a few days of conferencing in January, this last January, we're very pleased that so many past and future participants of the conference um, have gathered this evening to celebrate the launch of this book. And we look forward to hopefully welcoming you in London in 2022. And we hope tonight's event gives a flavor of the kind of cutting edge research that is shared and developed by the conference. And just a few uh, notes of housekeeping before I hand over to one of my co-editors. Uh, you'll be muted throughout uh, the event. So if you have any questions or concerns, just please raise them in the chat. Um, if you have any technical questions, you can direct those to either to me or to my colleague, Martina, who is also on hand to help. And you'll also find that we have enabled auto captioning at the bottom of the screen. So now to introduce one of my co-editors, Suzanne Bargett is head of research and academic partnerships at Imperial War Museums, where she's responsible for initiating research projects, which feed into IWM's public program and help to better understand its collections. Her book, Wartime London in Paintings, about the IWM's officially commissioned paintings of London during the Second World War, was published in 2020. I'll hand over to Suzanne. Thanks very much indeed, Christine. Um, and as Christine said, um, if, if things had gone according to plan, we would have been holding the seventh Beyond Camps conference last month. And it was much regret that we decided we needed to postpone till next year. But gathering as many of the conference's loyal followers together as we have to celebrate the publication of this volume seemed a very good idea. So I'm here together with um, Christine and also Dan Stone. Um, the three of us were the editors of the book. Um, together, we've had the really great pleasure of bringing the publication to fruition um, with a lot of the work happening in this last year. I realized though that the book's origins go back well beyond then um, to the time when we put out the call for papers for the 2018 conference. <clears throat> so the authors present tonight will know that their chapters first started to take shape a full five years ago. The sixth conference was, of course, held in memory of David Cesarani, a close colleague of all three editors and of the wider conference planning group. And we're very pleased that David's widow, Dawn Waterman, is with us here this evening. To quote from the first pages of the book, David's passing was a premature death which dismayed the whole of Holocaust scholarship and history more broadly. For delegates attending the 2018 conference, the loss felt particularly raw. 
David had been key to the planning and leadership of the previous conferences and had always had plenty to say at them, and his absence that cold January was palpable. Many of you here tonight will remember well David's keen interest in what everyone was doing and the way he encouraged us all. So it is very fitting that this volume is dedicated to his memory. A few comments now on the book. Firstly, it celebrates international collaboration. The authors in the volume come from Austria, Chile, the Czech Republic, Germany, Hungary, Israel, Mexico, and the US, as well as the UK. Many authors are writing in a language that is not their first, and I have great admiration for this. It's not something I could do. Secondly, the book celebrates extraordinary talent and dedication. Dedication because the subjects the authors have tackled are never easy. For those surviving research, researching survivors and how they struggle to rebuild their lives, there is the constant backdrop of the persecution they endured during the war. For those dealing with subjects like medical experiments or the T4 program, which saw young children with disabilities murdered in their thousands, it must be particularly hard. And both these topics are covered in this volume. It's when you look closely at the footnotes that you realize how many hours would have been spent in archives, often far from home, wading through records, often going back to the solitude of a hotel or lodgings in the evenings. This perhaps prosaic but I think important aspect of Holocaust scholarship needs to be remembered. It can be hard and deeply upsetting to work on this subject. The conference has in many ways given a special shared space to the academics who have chosen this particular path. And this is one of the reasons why a three day conference on Zoom just would not have worked. Thirdly, the book pushes back the frontiers of knowledge in unexpected ways. So we have insights into countries whose post-war roles are less well known, certainly within English language historiography. My own knowledge was greatly enriched in the editing process. I feel as though I have visited the Lithuanian city of Klaipeda. So vivid is Ruth Lazarevitz's depiction of this city, which having been virtually emptied at the end of the war, was transformed by the Soviets into a vast seaport, offering new opportunities to those settling there. Similarly, Katerina Kralova's sensitive study of Esther Franco, who as a very young child in wartime Greece was orphaned and who struggled for the rest of her life with her true identity. That is an account which has stayed with me. So Dan, Christine and I divided up the essays between us to edit and we got to know our individual authors quite well. It was a truly fascinating process. Christine played an invaluable role in pulling everything together, liaising with the publishers and operating various complicated online systems. These could really be quite baffling. And so Dan and I are very grateful to Christine for that. I've talked about the role of the three editors. A larger number of people have been involved in the wider enterprise of the conference itself, of course, and several of them are here to this evening. So I would like to thank the conference committee. First, Dieter Steinert, who has, since the conference's inception, taken the lead in organising the call for papers and liaising with delegates, a huge amount of work. Ben Barco, with whom I share the editing of the Holocaust in Context series, who has helped in all kinds of ways, not least in securing funding for the 2018 conference. David Feldman and Jan Davison of the Pears Institute for Antisemitism, whose unstinting support has been valued throughout. And finally, Amber Pierce for assembling the book's index, which is never an easy task. And now to our first speakers. I'm delighted to introduce Nancy Nichols, who lectures in history at the Pontificia Universidad Católica di Chile. Yeah, uh, Nancy uh, works with Yael Siman, who's professor at the Ibero Americano University in Mexico City. And unfortunately, Yael is unable to be with us this evening. They work together on survivors who migrated to Chile and Mexico, and their chapter shows the thoughtful use they have made of oral history to document this little known story. So I'd like to hand over now to Nancy, Nancy Nichols. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Suzanne. Uh, yes, for family reasons, Yael couldn't attend today, so I will speak for both of us. Um, is the volume? Yeah, it's, I think it's right. Our research aimed to analyze the migration trajectories to Chile and Mexico and the integration processes that followed of Holocaust survivors before, during, and after World War II. These two countries, among others in Latin America, were part of the transnational history of forced displacement, refuge, migration, and adaptation to the host countries that took place beyond the European continent and that extend temporarily beyond the end of the war and the Holocaust. We decided with the IL to study these two Latin American countries, first of all, because we were struck by the fact that Chile had received between uh, 10,000 and 13,000 European Jewish migrants between 1933 and 1939, and Mexico only 1,800 to 2,000 between 1933 and 1945. We also wanted to investigate how the migration process and subsequent adaptation or acculturation, if any, had been affected by the structural conditions of both countries in the period. This included migration policies, availability of work, possibilities for social mobility, attitudes and treatment of migrants by the local populations. So the contribution of our research lies in the comparative study between Chile and Mexico, since uh, between the work on the subject, it is more common to find analysis that focus on a particular Latin American country. And although Latin America uh, history in the mid 20th century has many aspects in common, it is also character characterized by great difference in cultural and political terms, for example. Our research was based on 42 oral testimonies from various collections, the Visual History Archive, the Fortunot Archive and Memoria Viva, plus those resulting from interviews conducted by us between 2017 and 2019. We have not reviewed document documentary material that we know would allow us to have a more complete picture of the migration process. Thus, the focus of our work is uh, on the stories of the survivors who migrated, who recall what they lived, reflect on their experiences, and give meaning to them from the present through the interviews. Subjectivity, therefore, is central to our analysis. We use a broad definition of Holocaust survivors that included any Jewish victim of Nazism, actual or potential, between 1933 and 1945. If we start by asking ourselves why there is a difference in the number of migrants, the answer is to be found fundamentally in migration policies. Chile allowed the entry of 50 Jewish families per year in the period uh, between 1932 to, and 1938, but that year a new president, Pedro Aguirre Cerda of the Popular Front, came to power and declaring that there were humanitarian reasons opened the doors to Jews escaping from Nazism in Europe and Spaniards escaping from the civil war. The survivors' testimonies give evidence of this, alluding to the fact that they decided to escape to Chile because it was the only country that granted visas, or alluding to Pedro Aguirre Cerda with words of gratitude. Mexico, on the other hand, did not have an official migratory policy towards Jews escaping Nazism. Both President Lázaro Cárdenas and President Ávila Camacho limited the entry of Jews into the country, which is related, among other factors, to the antisemitism of some members of the political elite in power, mestizaje, miscegenation, as a paradigm of identity, and the idea that Jews could not be assimilated into the Mexican nation. Also, the presence of family in both countries was an important pull factor. Neither of the two countries were chosen or desired destinations when the need and even the urgency to escape from Europe became evident. Little, if anything, was even known about Chile. Both destinations, however, represented the concrete possibility of fleeing Europe and Nazi persecution. We were able, able to see that once in Chile and Mexico, the migrants managed to start from scratch, setting, setting up small family business most of the time. And when I say small, I am referring, for example, to a married couple who set up a clothing manufacturing workshop with two imported sewing 
uh, machines and one employee, which in time manages to become flourishing and successful companies. In both countries, the migrants had a cultural capital that was very important for launching economic survival initiatives. But the economic context was also favorable. In both countries in the mid 20th century, industrialization and modernization process were being promoted, thus stimulating local production in the case of Chile to the detriment of imports. Mexico placed greater obstacle than Chile for the work of Jewish migrants, at least this is what we have observed so far, since the testimonies speak of the need to have a work permit, while in Chile there is no mention of any occasion of difficulties of working from the moment of arrival. In neither country was there significant anti-Semitism on the part of the population. There are specific and limited manifestation, for example, some cities in southern Chile, such as Valdivia, with a high German colonizing uh, presence, part of which was pro-Nazi in this period. However, there were nuances in the acceptance of Jewish migrants in both countries, which are related both to state-driven identity constructs and to imaginaries and models of what is acceptable and desirable as an identity. In Mexico, a national identity construction based on mestizaje predominated in the 30s and 40s, leaving out everything that did not fit into this category and that were considered unassimilable. This, together with the fact that the country did not have a tradition of migration and that it was mostly Catholic, placed certain obstacles to the integration of the survivors. There are testimonies that once in Mexico, they were seen as foreigners, fell out of place, and even came to be seen as threats to the jobs of the local population. In Chile, although there, there is a very marked anti-Semitism on the part of several consuls who served in various European cities in the pre-war and the war years, the general population held different views. They were seen as white Europeans rather than Jews and were beneficiaries of positive discrimination since the white racial ideal historically constructed by the Chilean elites predominated. The process uh, of adaptation, integration, and acculturation took place in this context. And as occurs in migration in general, the family and the ethnic community already settled in both countries were key. They provided the first material and emotional care and support. They lodged and fed them. They also acted as a very relevant support network in the arrival when everything was new, different, and even produced a cultural shock. For the vast majority of Jewish migrants, Chile and Mexico became their permanent place of residence. However, in some cases, these two countries acted as an escaped route from Europe, as transitional spaces, points on a longer mobility itinerary that had at its final destination other countries, such as Argentina, Venezuela, the United States, Canada, and Israel. In other cases, Chile and Mexico were places where a lasting life project was established, but for various reasons, lack of integration into local societies, seeking better jobs opportunities, of reuniting with relatives who had settled in other countries, and even for fear of local political events, they emigrated again and settled permanently in these destinations. Here we find the fundamental difference between Chile and Mexico. In political terms, Mexico showed greater stability throughout these years, while Chile experienced historical periods of high intensity with the Marxist government of Salvador Allende between 1970 and 1973, and then the military dictatorship of Pinochet. These two events, especially the former, prompted a new migration of Holocaust survivors. In the case of Allende's coming to power, there were survivors who felt their freedom and economic capital threatened, which motivated them to migrate again. Not all, but many of the Jews who emigrated again with Allende or even before when the project of so social change and structural reforms were already, already underway, had migrated to Chile after the end of the war from Eastern European countries that had become part of the Soviet orbit. Therefore, despite the great difference, differences between the regime of these countries and again the socialism, they felt threatened and frightened by the possibility of experiencing sorry, a new totalitarianism. 
Those who made Chile and Mexico their definite place of residence created permanent homes, formed families, and integrated themselves into various spheres of national life, contributing above all to the economic development of both host countries. Although they adapted to Chile and Mexico experiences a process of acculturation, they created few ties with the local population, favoring the links and sociability relations between the local Jewish communities. Their identity processes have been marked by the combination of their Jewish and European origin and their experiences learning and transformation both in Chile and Mexico. As Gunther Selman, a German Jew who emigrated to Chile in 1939 has expressed, identity is not monolithic, it is multifaceted. The extent to which traumatic experiences of the survivors who settled in Chile and Mexico were worked through requires further research. What place did the local Jewish communities and the families already settled occupy in this objective? And in what ways did the national context favor or impede the narration of the trauma? The testimony sheds some very interesting light on this subject, which remains to be explored in depth. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Nancy, for that interesting account of your research. And um, I'm sure everyone will look forward to reading that in the book. Now, um, I think we're going to have questions at the end. So I'm going to pass over to Christine um, to introduce the next speaker. So thank you again. Thanks. Thanks, Suzanne. And thanks, Nancy. Um, yes, please. And we will take questions at the end. But if you have any in the in the meantime, please feel free to stick them in the chat and we will get to as many as possible. Um, after our speakers. So it's my pleasure to introduce Stephanie Hesswood, who is an AHRC funded doctoral student in the Department of History at Royal Holloway University of London. Her PhD thesis entitled A Spatial History of Drancy, Architecture, Appropriation and Memory is an interdisciplinary, is interdisciplinary in approach combining architectural history with social and cultural history. Stephanie received her MA from the Courtauld Institute of Art, funded by an AHRC postgraduate award, in which she specialized in the history and theory of the museum, focusing her thesis on Holocaust memorialization in Vienna. Her chapter for our volume, which was, I have to say, truly a pleasure and very easy to edit, uh, confronts the transformation of the Drancy camp, which is, of course, now synonymous with the internment and deportation of Jews in France. Her chapter goes beyond the camp's wartime history, examining its history before and after the war and stimulates broader questions about spatial and cultural questions concerning the social responsibility of urban planning and, and a host of other important uh, questions and issues. So without further ado, handing you over to Steph. Hi there, thank you so much for that lovely introduction and um, for your kind words. I'm gonna share my screen because I'm gonna show um, a few images. Um, please tell me this is gonna work. Okay. Um, slideshow. Um, yes, thank you so much. So I, I will just um, sort of qu quickly introduce um, my research, which is, a, I, I have to admit, a distillation of um, my thesis, <laughs> um, which was a really uh, valuable, even though uh, Christine has very kindly said it was easy to edit, edit, actually her feedback and the process of going through this was hugely valuable to me um, at that stage, which was a number of years ago now, but still, I'm still doing my PhD. So um, it was a hugely um, helpful and uh, supportive um, moment for me and, and I'm really really very grateful to be part of this publication so thank you to all the editors. Um, I will just start by describing, uh, I'll just go through what I've written about relatively informally if that's okay just because um, Christine's given such a great introduction really covering the themes that I, I'm, I'm talking about but so Drancy is now synonymous with most, if people have heard of the name of Drancy in the context of the Holocaust, most people do immediately think of the internment camp. But what, what my thesis um, uh, and my, my chapter, I should really focus on my chapter, that talks about is, um, is it, it, it is this spatial history, this idea of looking at one site through time. 
and how perceptions of that place shift over time and why that is. And that is both perceptions from those in turn, those on the, on, on the, on the periphery, those who, um, who, who, who come to the site afterwards and those who seek to memorialize it. So I just wanted to start off by explaining that, that, that John C. before the war um, is a town on the periphery of Paris, northeast of Paris and the suburbs, not too far away from, from center of, of town at all. And it's, um, this, this building you're looking at now, which is um, a good photograph, but not great in terms of it, because it is, it is a, this is the central quad of, of, of the Cité de la Mouette, which is a housing development, which was built by two French architects, Eugène Baudouin and Marcel Lodz, in designs in the end of the 1920s, built in the 1930s, that could not be finished because of lack of funding and various other complicated issues at the time. And it was um, appropriated by initially the, 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 the French um, army uses barracks, but then during occupation from 1940 um, was taken over by the Germans, the Wehrmacht, and in 1941 it became a camp. And, this, and so my, 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 my chapter discusses this, the traumatic intervention of the, of the Holocaust, how it, how it changed this place forever, and how it started off as a model city, as this incredible, this vision the architects had was, was a utopian vision for uh, social housing development, for a complete community, for for uh, those who were who who were, who were lucky enough to, to live there, as they saw it, was to have this sense of uh, this sense of social integration, a huge quad with a massive space in the middle, which had which was meant to generate certain engagement, which was meant to make people feel a part of community, make people feel they are part of a home, that they are all private, but, but, but able to get engaged with one another, but again, a part of this idea of the uh, sort of a modern interpretation of the garden city, the Cité Jardin, which was um, the, the, the office of, uh, of, of the social housing uh, uh, were, were, were engaging with at that time because of, of lack of, of, of funding, um, mass housing, um, funding for, uh, for, for the masses. So if I just take you through these images, um, I, ha I unfortunately ha I wasn't able to get rights yet for images uh, during its, its building, which are very interesting because you can see that it's prefabricated um, concrete. It's very novel in its approach. It's very novel in its, in its material. I talk, talk a lot about material um, symbolism in my work, which is about thinking about what concrete means. What and then in terms of it being not so much a new material as as, as it actually is, but it's the perception of, of its newness and what that means. And also, and then this idea of it, this unfinished building being appropriated, becoming an internment camp, and people being initially held there for approximately a year before deportation started, which was in, in 1942 to 1944, um, the, summer, the summer of 1942 to 1944 is when the deportation started. And so what my chapter does is tells the story of before, during and after the intervention of the Holocaust and, and, and brings it up to date to it being a site of memory now and, and what that journey was and the, the complications that occurred in that process. And, um, Oh, that's not done on the thing. Why is that not moving? I'm trying to move my slide across. I'll try it by nearly down there. There you go. Um, so ooh, I don't know what to do now. Sorry, apologies. Just flick through. But if I just take you through, that's this. So this image we're on now is an image of it during during um, the war as an internment camp. And you can see, I should sorry, I should have probably mentioned the the, the, the city de la Muette, This housing development was a huge quad, um, a U shaped building and then it also comprised of uh, a number of towers you can see in the background there alongside it which no which were raised to the ground in 1976 but it did not take it's sort of it's quite uh, unsettling to think about these with which this camp became uh, the sorry this this housing development mass housing development became uh, uh, a, a camp uh, just by putting up barbed wire it was sort of this, this place that was designed, as I said, for social unity became a site of deprivation with very relative, relative ease. Um, and so my chapter takes you through to, from, from the Holocaust, and again, I use a huge, as, as we've just heard, I, I also use a huge amount of um, uh, testimony, evidence um, um, from, from the, uh, the Holocaust, um, from the, sorry, uh, the or, 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 um, VHA um, Visual History Archive, 
um, and and I found it absolutely invaluable resources to, to, to countless um, accounts of, of those who, who survived Drossi. And I just wanted to mention one person in particular who I, I think may well be listening live now if she's not in California. Um, uh, so I can now call my friend, um, Michelle Cohen Rodriguez, whose story, whose incredible story of survival as a child um, is, in, is in my chapter and also in my thesis. And uh, we, we, we speak regularly now and it's a, it's a huge honor to know that she might be listening now. If she's not, she'll be catching up later, but um, thank you so much to Michelle for her invaluable time. Both, uh, I, I, we, we connected after I, I found her absolutely extraordinary testimony, which I discussed in my chapter um, in, 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 in which her, her brother, who uh, is part of the Maquis, uh, rescues her from Jean C as an age as a child of age seven, who had been taken away from her family, and it's a pretty extraordinary account um, of survival and, and endurance. And her perspe perspective on life since then is is, is 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 truly inspiring. So I just wanted to mention mention her there. Um, and and this and and just just to, I think I'm running out of time. Let's just take you up to date. Um, this is the view from inside this museum, um, the top floor. And this is a museum that was only built in terms of the memorialization of the site. There's a conflict between the significance of Drancy in terms of the architect its relevance in the architectural canon, because of its, it was hugely celebrated at the time it was being built, um, influenced by Le Corbusier, its relevance in the architectural canon is, is significant. And also it, it has a site of, Holocaust memory, and we can see here as we're looking out the window of the of the of the um, of the museum, which opened in, only in 2012. We can see two memorials that were, that were placed um, on the site. So the one in in, in the foreground, well, to, to the right of the screen, is uh, Shlomo Selinger's memorial that was um, put in place in um, in 1976, a rose granite monument, and behind it uh, a, 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 a railway wagon which was installed in 1988 with. A, a which was also involved the artist German Senator, a sort of collaboration between him and, and the mayor at the time. And so it took a long time. It was only in 2001 that the site was fully recognized. The actual building itself was recognized as a site of, um, as, a, as a historical monument, giving it the protection, affording it protection, financial protection and, and various other things. And uh, it took a long time for the, the museum to be built and for it to, the decision process which I discuss uh, for, for the, the, the site itself to not be used um, as a place, uh, as the museum itself, but rather which would, would, which would have uh, been catastrophic in its displacement of those who lived there. Um, and I, should, I don't know if I even mentioned that, but I should say that it is social housing now. It returned to social housing after the war. I didn't perhaps mention that so, and emphatically enough that it is uh, social housing even it's not it's in a guise sort of antithetic to how it was originally envisioned by the architects but it is social housing nonetheless the buildings you see in the background there are not part of the city de la but this quad in the center is and um and uh so i'm just going to change slides and see that that's the museum and there's the monument up close and there's the view from the uh, cath one up back to the museum itself so you can see the museum itself does overlook um, in a sort of watchtower like way. I mean, I, I use that phrase in terms of this, there is a sort of tension between seeing and being seen, which I discuss in my work as well. And there is still a problematic dialogue there that is to do with uh, living memory um, and the persistence of, 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 of the ne necessity to forget and the necessity to remember as people live in this building um, and want to move on in, in with their lives without forgetting the relevance and the potency of the building, which they now call home. So I hope that <laughs> summarizes it well enough for you there. Thanks, Steph. That's not that at all. fantastic. Thank that you. was a great um, preview of your article. And of course, we're really privileged, privileged to be able to publish um, this before it comes out in book form. If you could just um, stop sharing your screen. Sure. Sorry. Um, yeah. That's okay. I'm going to... Um, Thanks, Steph. Um, I'm going to hand over to my other co-editor, Dan Stone, who is Professor of Modern History and Director of the Holocaust Research Institute at Royal Holloway University of London. Um, his latest book, Fate Unknown, Tracing the Missing After the Holocaust and World War II, is going to be published by OUP next uh, this year, in 2021. And he's currently completing a book on the Holocaust for Penguin's revived Pelican series. So handing over to you, Dan, to introduce our next speaker. Thanks, Christine. Uh, it might actually be next year when Fate Unknown is published, but, you know, we'll wait. We'll see. Um, just to reiterate what Christine and Suzanne uh, have said, it's, it's really nice to see everybody. 
uh, it's been a, a great pleasure uh, co-editing this book. Uh, and it's, it's a real shame that we haven't been able to hold the conference this year, but I hope that the book uh, will be uh, a little reminder to everybody of the, the great work that, uh, that goes on in, in the conference and uh, keep, keep people occupied uh, in the meantime until we can reconvene, hopefully, uh, next January. Okay, our final speaker this evening is uh, Ruth Lizerowitz. Uh, she's the uh, Deputy Director at the German Historical Institute in Warsaw and Professor of East European History at the Humboldt uh, University of Berlin. Her research is focused on European history in the 19th and 20th centuries with a focus on transnational history, Baltic history, Jewish history, and the history of memory and border regions. Her most recent publication, before the one in this book, uh, is Litvak Traders and Their Spatial Dimensions at the Turn of the 19th Century. And her chapter in the book uh, is called Jews and Their Informal Space in Klaipeda, 1945 to 1960. And uh, I'm now going to hand over to Ruth to uh, talk about it. Yes, uh, good evening, everybody. And uh, I like to thank uh, very much uh, the editors first for their work, also especially to uh, edit, fighting with my poor English, and, uh, and second for inviting me for today's uh, um, presentation. So I will share my, um, my screen. So, yes. And uh, uh, thank you for the nice introduction, Dan. And um, I um, make a summary about my um, my essay, Jews and their informal space in Kleipeda. I will start uh, um, to uh, say some words about the research question, and then uh, about reason uh, reasons for Jews coming after 1945 to the town of Klaipeda and uh, about uh, Jewish identity and uh, religious uh, dimensions. Um, how could Jews in the Soviet Union who had survived either the Holocaust or the flight from the Holocaust put their lives back together after the war? What problems confronted them and what strategies did they develop in order to overcome them? What possibilities uh, did they have for expressing their life as the Jews? This period was marked by the pattern of late Stalinism, accompanied by the problems that arose for families who had been wholly or partially destroyed, as well as by questions about both emigration and the search for models by which to live. In January 1945, the depopulated and extensively damaged city, Klaipeda was taken over by the Red Army and was then integrated into the territory of the Lithuanian Socialist uh, Soviet Republic. After the Soviet troops had seized Memel, the government in Vilnius decided to appoint a new administration in Memelland and to bring in new people to resettle it. Only a few local people had managed to stay on during the fighting. The party functionaries could not imagine the people from Mimeland returning again. Ruth, the, Ruth, yes? sorry to interrupt. Did you mean to share your screen? Yes. You haven't? I haven't. No. Oh, I... Sorry to interrupt you. Yes. That's it. Okay. Thank you. So, sorry. Yes. Okay. So. So 
Okay. Uh, sorry, the Soviet Lithuanian government sought to resettle the region as quickly as possible and sent people from other districts to the town and the region. After the liberation in January 1945, it was estimated that 28% of the city had been destroyed and a further 36% badly damaged. The situation in Klaibeda at the end of the war was atypical since the town had lost its entire population as a result of the evacuation of 1944. Consequently, by, necess by necessity, it would have to be resettled. At the end of 1945, around 6,000 residents lived in Klaipeda, and by 1947, this figure had increased to 51,000. And uh, some reasons for choosing Klaipeda for Jews. In the first years, recruiting people to resettle was primarily done by the representatives of the state enterprises who were known as the Verbovchikti, what means recruiters. Stories of the good life to be had in Klaipeda also played a part. And uh, all my, my voices, uh, I, I quote, that a um, Jewish member from the Jewish community uh, who I have uh, interviewed. And here one quote, I had a sister already there. After the war, she started her own life. She came to Klaipeda and why? Our cousin worked here. She was married to a Polish Jew who came from Warsaw. They came here together and settled well. And when my husband as an officer was demobilized in 1956, she told me that we should come here as well. At the time we had no bread, especially no white bread. And I was working then at the Gosbank. Our child was small and my mother was still living with me. And then my sister said that we should come because we could have a nice life here, unquote. Likewise, families arrived when the husbands or fathers were transferred there as members of the military. In one account, the father of the family, a soldier, was transferred to Königsberg. In 1945, after the end of war, the family returned from evacuation and went to Gommel, that's uh, Belarus today. However, as a witness recounts, there was, in, there was nothing there because um, the soldier wanted this family close by. He fixed for them to come to Klaipeda in 46. I quote, he had a stay in the Hotel Victoria, which earlier had been the most upscale hotel in the town, but was now functioning as a hostel for resettlers. We lived there for a while. All the houses were destroyed. We were he here for less than a year. Then we were back in Gommel for another year. In 1947, we came back here um, because um, we got a room in one of the houses on Lenin Square. Four families shared that flat. In many migration stories, family connections played an essential role. Mira Frank came to Kleipeda as a 22-year-old along with her two sisters. Um, remembered. A relative from Chernovitz, that is from South Ukraine, from Bukovina, returned from the army. He went to Lithuania, having lost his family. Then he wrote, I would like to help you. I have gotten myself well established here, come. He worked in a trading company and had a flat. So we left Chernovitz and went there at the end of 1946. There were maybe 2,000 Jews in town. We were there at our cousin's. He had a flat. The accommodation was really good. I got a job and then began an apprenticeship. And uh, some words about the Jewish identity and the religious dimensions. In the immediate post-war years, there appears to have been a sense of cohesion among the newly returned Jews in Klaipeda. Memoirs repeatedly mention Jewish doctors who attended to fellow Jews, helping them rebuild their lives. 
Zara Vidovsky, who had been hidden for several years and subsequently suffered from severe insomnia, was cured in Klaipeda by a doctor who placed her in an artificial sleep from which she was only periodically awakened to ask to be eat. To ask to eat. This was not about being aided by a medical institution, but a rather through personal dedication and conviction. Another witness tells this story about Jewish doctors in the city, I quote. Our mother got to know a few Lithuanian Jews. They helped us by giving us contributions and also with clothing. She often had contact with Dr. Zuckerman. In this context is what the presence of Jewish doctors as well as contact with them that was underscored by several persons. The degree of commitment to Judaism during the Soviet period is described in quite, quite varied ways, especially as it concerned the children and adolescents in the years after arriving in Klaipedam. There were people who simply never mentioned that they were Jewish, nor did people tend to have conversation about religion. It was simply not discussed, no topic. As to the question of which holidays would be celebrated, the answer was the Soviet holidays. We all spoke Russian among ourselves. We also went to Russian schools. But there are also comments indicated that friends and relatives traveled to Vilnius for the Jewish holidays since there were a lot of Jews there. The Yiddish language still played a role for many within the home, however. In the census of 1959, more than a third, uh, 34% uh, of the Jews in Klaipeda reported that Yiddish was the mother tongue. Interestingly, only the female family members, mothers and grandmothers, are highlighted as speakers of Yiddish. A witness reports that their mother spoke Yiddish with the children at home. Another report said her mother always wrote letters in Yiddish. A third person recounts that the grandmother, who came from Lithuania, spoke Yiddish, and so she learned from her many Yiddish expressions and also same songs, which she, she still knows. And uh, my short summary. The Jewish immigration as part of the Soviet measures for the military and economic integration of the harbor town of Klaipeda was not a unique phenomenon, but rather typical of the various regions be being integrated into the USSR in 1945. Jews who had lived there before the war and were returning from the interior of the USSR, as well as the Jewish new arrivals, frequently felt a bond through the common experience of the evacuation into the interior of the USSR. They all shared in the experience of this period as a phase of Sovietization. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ruth. It's uh, an extremely interesting uh, piece of work and uh, I think really, really fascinating to, uh, to see, especially I think uh, in comparison what you said about about Yiddish um, in comparison with the other cities in Lithuania, that uh, was quite quite striking. Okay, um, so with that um, final talk, that brings the formal part of the, our presentation of the book to an end. Um, so if anybody has any questions or comments, please put them in the chat, and uh, one of the editors will read them out. Christine's put up a link to the table of contents for people who are interested. Well, I'm going to ask Ruth a question then, uh, if nobody else wants to um, wants to kick off, uh, and and that is in in your chapter you talk about the absence of anti-Semitism in Klaipeda after the war, uh, and that's really striking in the border regions of the Soviet Union, especially by comparison with Ukraine. Why do you think that is? Um, okay, um, the anti-Semitism was mainly founded on. Uh... Um, uh, hate um, between neighbors and uh, 
you see, in we had in this uh, town only newcomers, and everybody had to, to organize his uh, his own life, and everybody was uh, was poor, and uh, so there were no big differences in uh, economic or, or um, in in wealthy. Thanks, Ruth. Anybody else want to ask a question? Here we go. One from Jessica Cretney for Steph. Um, Steph, could you say more about how the main building was adapted in order to be used as a camp? Sure, yes. <laughs> um, so the main building wasn't finished. I don't know if, if I emphasized that enough um, earlier. So it wasn't finished when it was taken over, when it was appropriated. So um, it was a lot, of, um, a lot of open windows, a lot of, in terms of like no, no actual windows in the window frames, no actual doors and door frames, unfinished stairwells, unfinished staircases, a lot of raw concrete finishes. And in terms of adapting it, they effectively um, had watchtowers on the periphery, they had um, barbed wire, um, they had searchlights, and that was pretty much the extent of what they needed to do because the actual shape of the main quad, which was a U-shape, um, was prison-like in its, in, its, in its sort of command of the space, um, and it was enclosed effectively on you know, three sides already. Um, so the boundary wall, which was the edge of the building, they, they put barbed wire beyond that and they put watchtowers, as I've said, and searchlights. But the actual, the actual structure itself um, was um, sort of helpful to their, um, to their purposes. So it, it, it wasn't a huge amount of change that was required um, to make it in, into the internment camp. If that answers that. Thank you very much. Anyone else want to Ask a question. Uh, well, question from Imogen DL. Uh, thank you, Imogen, for your congratulations. Uh, is there any resistance? This is for you, Steph, again. Is there any resistance on the part of those who now live in the social housing in Droncy in relation to living next to the museum and the memorial? Um. Well, this is an aspect of my research that actually isn't in the chapter and that, that is that, that hopefully my PhD will cover, but I haven't been able to, for various reasons, um, get to that in, in the depth I wanted to. The short answer is um, um, others, the books I've read in the process of reading have, have described resistance in terms of um, disruption, you know, there were, in terms of renovations, in terms of um, people coming too close to their building. This is obviously their, their home. But and also the main the main concern that, that was that was raised as I mentioned in the process of the, of the museum itself being built um, was this idea of the possibility of them having to be displaced, the possibility of that building, the actual citadel and work, the actual housing development being turned into the museum, and that was uh, I think a concern for a number of for a period of time for those for, for the residents there. But in terms of the resident, I think the majority of people just want to get on with their lives who live there they don't want to it's, this is what I was saying about this tension between forgetting and remembrance which is necessary um because this is that these are their homes this that you know I think there I think there is a definitely problems with the museum itself looking over you know floor to ceiling glass windows as as you saw in the images um looking over the site um but I also think there are problems with the amount of people who are, who go to the museum and um you know so in terms of uh, the necessary process of remembrance you know, to, to, for that to continue, there, there is a balance. But in terms of the people who live there, I think it's 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 not sort of one narrative there. It's a con, sort of combination of narratives of those who've lived there for a long time, those with families, those who don't want to understand, really don't want to engage with the history of the site, those who are engaged with it, but also you know, um, pragmatically get on with their lives. But that's not that's not dealt with in detail in my chapter. So I don't want to pretend that that's a huge part of my research at this stage because it isn't. But I have certainly read a huge amount of accounts and. It is really interesting. It's a really interesting aspect that I want to pursue further, certainly, and I haven't had, had the opportunity to mainly because of restrictions of travel and all kinds of things. But it's, um, yeah, it's a very interesting, interesting question. Something that, um, yeah, it would be. I will look at in the future, certainly, in more detail. But yeah, thank you. Thank you, Steph. Uh, there are two questions for for you, Nancy. 
which I will take together because I think they, they relate to each other. Uh, the first from Marcia Waldstreicher, uh, how can we learn more about the immigration of Jews to Latin America and their movements after the war? And then the second one from Naomi Vergesi, um, how did Chile's policy towards Jewish survivor immigration compare to that of other South American countries? Thank you. Um, Sorry, Nancy, we can't hear you. You've muted yourself. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I was saying, uh, Marcia, that uh, there is the bibliography that talk about the migration of uh, Latin American in general. And perhaps if you write to me, I can give you the list of the most important books. But it's a very interesting uh, question because there is a difference between the people that came um, before the war and after. And we know that after the war uh, came less people but people that, uh, for different reasons, were trying to, to leave Europe. You know? uh, in the testimonies, there are some of these uh, reasons, the fear of uh, another war, the totalitarianism of the uh, countries that were part of the Soviet uh, Union or the orbit of the Soviet Union. So, and also there were people that uh, lived through the Holocaust. And it was different from the people that came in the early 30s or 1938 or 1939. So uh, I offer to you the, to write to me and I, I can, give, can give you some uh, titles. And um, about the policy towards the Jewish uh, survivor, I know that um, Chile was uh, exceptional in this sense only because of this uh, president. And I know Mexico opened the doors to the uh, refugees from uh, the civil war, the Spanish civil war, but not uh, for the Jews. Uh, and from uh, the panorama in, uh, in Latin America, Chile was the third country uh, to receive more uh, Jewish migration in this period. Uh, Argentina was the first one and then Brazil. So Argentina and Brazil also have uh, more open uh, politics, but also we know that a lot of people entered the country uh, not through legal ways. No, that was very common. Even people that arrived to Chile, we know for the testimonies, leave the country through the Cordillera de los Andes in an illegal way. Sometimes they took more than one, two or three uh, intents to, to reach uh, Argentina. So I think in Chile was a, a particular moment, 38, 1938, 1939, that coincided with the time when people really wanted to, to escape Europe. And there was this moment, uh, a special moment, uh, so people can come to Chile. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy, um, for a very full answer. Uh, well, I don't see any more questions and uh, it's uh, coming up to eight o'clock so uh, I think we'll probably draw this to a close so it just remains for me to thank everybody for coming um, if you have a spare hundred pounds you can buy the book so I would advise uh, advise uh, getting it from your local library instead um, and uh, thank you all for coming and um, goodbye <laughs> thank you very much goodbye Thanks, everybody. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.